Hi everybody, and welcome to my video introducing the Ricomatic 225 Twin Lens Reflex Camera. Now, if you've never used a Twin Lens Reflex before, one thing you're going to notice is it's much different from a standard uh, SLR or point-and-shoot camera. It's more upright and more boxy, and it's called a reflex camera. Not because anything in it moves, but because of the reflex action of the light coming in through the viewing lens hitting the mirror inside of it upside down and then being flipped back to the correct viewing angle um, when you see it through the viewfinder. That's why it's called a reflex. Also with single lens reflex cameras it's called a reflex because it changes the angle, it, ch it reverses the image through the mirror so that it looks uh, correct and upright when you see it through the viewfinder. It is a uh, <clears throat> a very, very nice advanced level TLR. It was, uh, even though it's old, it, it's, uh, man, it's a great camera. I can't wait. Wait until the end of this video. There's going to be some samples I've taken with this exact camera, and some of them are spectacular. <clears throat> uh, just a great quality. I'm not going to say the photos are spectacular. The camera took some spectacular photos. So anyway, so this is an advanced TLR for its age in that it has an onboard averaging meter. And here's the meter cover behind the nameplate. <coughs> Excuse me. And so you can see, um, so that's so that's the meter right there. It also has, uh, it has shutter speeds that go from bulb through 1 500th of a second, which it's got a leaf shutter down here. And that's a pretty good speed for a leaf shutter. That's about as fast as they can really go. The magnification through the viewfinder is about 92%. Uh, it has a, a grid matte screen. We'll get to that in a minute. So the image that you see on the on the viewfinder is about 92% of what's actually going to be seen on the um, film plane. It's a very bright, very large image. It's very easy to focus with this camera. Uh, it has a grid matte focusing screen. It has flash syncs here for F-bulbs and X -electro uh, xenon electronic flashes. Ricoh, when they built this, it was, you know, the research said it was intended for, everything I found in the research sa said that it was intended for entry to advanced level users. That's a ridiculous range for a camera, and no one does that anymore. Um, honestly, with as many bells and whistles as this has, it feels like a camera that was really meant for people who had some experience using twin lens reflex cameras. But with uh, as intuitive as it is to use and with as accessible as all of the functions are, it, it's easy to pick up very quickly and feels like it's designed for somebody who's not really all that familiar with TLRs. So <coughs> this could be that camera that everyone can use. Uh, it has, so, uh, it was produced by Riken Kogako, uh, <laughs> uh, my foreign language is awful, I'm from the Midwest, you'll have to forgive me. It's, it was produced by Riken Kogaku Kogio, or Riken KK, as it was called before it was called Rico, in 1959. And what surprised me is that in all the research I did, the only thing I could find out about this production is that it was only made in 1959. I couldn't find anything that indicated that it was made before or after. And it also seemed that Rico changed models often. So the model before this, some of the later ones would have things in common with this one. And then the model before that would have things in common with that model. And it would change throughout the production run. Uh, it sounded sort of like something that would drive most manufacturers uh, just crazy today. Um, but it was produced in Japan, and it was produced, it was preceded by numerous Ricoh diacords. Diacord is a, um, a conjunction. A conjunction is not the right word, and I have a master's in English, I should know this, but it's a shortening of a word, and it's uh, short for diamond and whatever chord. There's, there's not a chord, but like Raleigh chord and things like that. Chord was used to indicate a level of camera. So, so the diachords were um, <clears throat> good cameras, and they were. Uh, so this was, and and this was preceded directly 
by the Rico diachord G. So this followed the diachord G. Interestingly, Rico called them chords, which is what Raleigh and the others used to indicate their mid-level TLRs, but the chord t cameras that Rico was producing were as good as the flex level TLRs. So if you've seen my Raleigh Flex old standard video, the Raleigh Flex was the top end of that uh, that Raleigh was making for TLRs. There's also a Raleigh Chord, which was somewhere in the middle. These R Rico Chords, or Dia Chords rather, were as good as the Raleigh Flexes and the other ones like that. It was uh, produced concurrently with Ricoh's 35mm rangefinders and 16mm compact cameras, as well as some other camera formats that Ricoh was producing at the time, but it was the only 120 TLR that was produced at the time, Rico, for the year that Ricoh produced it. It was followed by the Ricoh Auto 66, and then no others. This was the second to last TLR that Ricoh produced before they stopped producing uh, TLR cameras. So you can follow along now. We're going to go through and we're going to take a look at the features of this camera, what everything is. A little bit later in the video we'll talk about how to use some of the features as well. So we're going to start with the camera's top up here. I'm sorry, we're going to start yeah, with the camera's top. And what we have here is the viewfinder cover. So we're going to lift this up and you can see inside there is a viewfinder and tilt it around, see if we can get something actually, there we go. You can kind of see, there's the uh, one of the studio lights, studio lights, that's... <laughs> anyway, um, so you can see inside there there's a focusing grid and the focusing mat, and you can see it's got the grid lines on it. The grid lines are both to help you focus and align, and align the image, but there's also a central box. That central box represents the area of the image covered by 35 millimeter uh, frames for when a 35 millimeter car film cartridge is put in this. I don't have the adapter for it, <clears throat> but this camera has a built-in function uh, in one, some of the switches to use 35 millimeter film. Now this um, this viewfinder cover itself is pretty great. You can see there's a little hole on the back here. Maybe you can't. Let's see. There we go. You can see the little hole in the back. If you flip down the front like that, and then look through the back, that's your speed finder. And that helps you align if you want to take a quick shot, like at a sporting event or something like that. And to close the front, you just do that with the lens. You can also see there's a magnifying glass here, which allows you to do very, very fine focusing on the focusing grid. Uh, it, the those, the, the, the size and the brightness of the grid combined with a magnifying glass allow very, very sharp pinpoint focusing uh, that is, and a lot of TLRs have that feature, but it's very nice on this camera and the lens supports the amount of focusing that this viewfinder can do, which is really great. It's, it's got a phenomenal, phenomenal lens on it. There's also the serial number up here uh, on, on the top. That's really it for the top. There's just not a whole lot on them, but that's just the way the TLRs are designed in general. On the camera's front, <coughs> on the camera's front, we've got the nameplate, and by pushing this little button on the side, the nameplate flips up, tells you again that it's Rico, and reveals the light meter. The light meter on this camera works. Wow, how did I do that? The light meter on this camera works just fine. Uh, in fact, many of them do. They were very, very well made. In addition, on the camera's front, we've got the... Um, so the light meter is a selenium photo cell, and that's actually what's behind... Uh, that's what these, these ripples, these bubbles are. That's the selenium photo cell in there. And uh, we have the shutter speed indicator. So actually on the top, when you're looking down on top of that lens... Oops. Yeah, there are three indicators on top of the lens here. And on the top right now it's set at one second, but that's your shutter speed indicator. And then there's a series of numbers, and we'll get to those a little bit later. They have to do with the light meter. And then there's the aperture at the back of it. And um, so so the light meter on this, we'll, we'll talk about later, it's a phenomenally 
intuitive once you understand how to use it. It's very well thought out. It's just unlike anything I've ever used before. I had to go and find out how to use it because I couldn't figure it out on my own. Um, then we've got the... Um, also on the front, we've got the shutter speed selector lever, which is this one. No, this 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 one. Here's the so this one. When you're holding the camera with your in your right hand, you select the shutter speed there. And got to make sure that you don't want to you don't want to adjust the shutter speed after the shutter is already cocked. So um, I just triggered the shutter and and. So this is uh, how you adjust the shutter. And when you adjust the shutter, the aperture also adjust, le changes. Watch the lever there on, the, on what's currently your right. So you can see as I adjust the shutter, the aperture is also being adjusted. Adjusting the aperture, however, does not adjust the shutter setting. So once you have the shutter set, the only way to change your um, exposure before taking it is with the aperture. You don't do not want to adjust the shutter after you've cocked it. And you cock the shutter by winding the crank. It's the only thing I really dislike about this camera. We've got the taking lens, I'm sorry, we've got the viewing lens up here, and we've got the taking lens down here. And we've got the um, shutter mode selector. Let's see if we can find that here. Shutter mode selector down here on the bottom for V, X, and M. M stands for uh, M sync for flash sync. X stands for uh, instantaneous electronic or xenon flash sync, and V stands for self timer. So V, I, I, I basically I always keep an M or X. On this camera, this specific one, M tends to work a little bit better. <coughs> one of the uh, things about these old cameras is that they, they develop some quirks. This one's definitely got its share of quirks. Um, it has, the, the shutter on this is a Seikosha SLV. If you have a Seiko watch, same company. Um, the, I have a Seiko SL, Seikosha L, SLV shutter for my large format camera for my Calumet and the, the Kaltar lens I have for that, it's amazing. Uh, I really have a lot of respect for the Seikosha shutters. I think they're really nice. Uh, See, we also have the uh, light meter dial. Oh yeah, light meter dial up there on the top. We'll talk about it in a minute. Flash sync socket right over here. That's for the, the PC, for the um, electronic flashes. And then the distance scale. So on the bottom here, as you adjust your focus, there's a little indicator that tells you wh how far uh, you're focusing from if that makes any sense. So there's a little indicator that says right now I'm focused at seven feet or slightly more than two meters. Okay. All right, so going now to the camera back. Camera back is pretty Spartan. We've got a depth of field scale. So if you wanted to calculate your depth of field, for instance, I know that I'm going to use F11 uh, so I'm going to find the F11 column, and I know that my subject is about 10 feet away from me. That tells me, and that's the top row here in the uh, in the silver, the dark is meters. So if, uh, if it's 10 feet, or let's say five, uh, 5 meters, that's not right. Well anyway, 10 feet away, that at F11, then I know that I need to set the... Uh, the depth of field is going to be from... Six, uh, from 7.3 feet to 16.4 feet. Uh, at um, so anyway, uh, it doesn't. Oh yeah, I guess it does make sense. Uh, depth of field scales really. I never, I've, I never use them. I don't find them to be horribly, horribly useful. Uh, I guess if you're trying to achieve a certain effect and can't see through your lens, like you, like with a TLR, it's useful. But at any rate, um, I don't find a whole lot of use in the depth of field scales. The camera sides have a bunch of stuff. We're going to start over on what is the left side when you're holding it. <coughs> and up at the top we have a camera strap lug right here. With the leather case, the leather case also has prongs that fit down into this little extrusion here to help keep the leather case uh, put. We have a hot shoe, a, uh, an X-Sync hot shoe right here. 
we have, uh, let's see, uh, and I started on the wrong side according to my outline, so that's frustrating. So we're just gonna go over here and do the other side. Okay, so we've got the <laughs> strap lug right here. Then we've got the film rewind lever up here. And this uh, doesn't work on my camera, actually. The exposure counter window up here so this counts how many exposures that you've taken for 120. There's a dial around the, the uh, film advance arm here. This counts how many exposures you've taken for 35 millimeter if you've got that adapter in. There's a button right here. This is your double exposure button. So after you take a picture, if you push this downward, or in this case down and back, that will allow you to take a double exposure. You push this down and back, advance the film, film arm lever. The film, arm, the film doesn't advance, but it recocks the shutter and then you can take a double exposure. The 35 millimeter counter dial, like I just said right around here, the film winding arm, which is this right here, so you advance the film one frame, and now I've also cocked the shutter. I'm gonna trigger it in case I wanna do anything with the shutter again. The, um, uh, now we go over to the other side, <clears throat> And we have the same thing, the strap lug, the flash hot shoe. This is your light meter assembly. Uh, and on the top is the film exposure index window. Then on the side here, this, this zebra stripe right above my thumb is the uh, light value scale. And that works in conjunction with this dial here, uh, the, which is, the, and also, uh, and then there's a little knob on the side of the dial which allows you to change the settings and that's the uh, film value lever and then down here we have the auto stop knob and this has to do with the 35 millimeter adapter since I don't have the 35 millimeter adapter I'm I do not know how to use this so if at some point I get the 35 millimeter adapter I will do a second video about how to use this the um, the light meter is kind of ingenious, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to use that right now since we're here. And when you flip this open, or not, on a sunny day you don't need to have it open on. Inside, for instance, like right now, I do. And there's a red, a red line here that now is at this first dark bar right here. And next to that is the number 15. I'm going to make sure I have this set correctly. So I've got the, I'm setting the ASA right now. So let's say I'm going to use AS, uh, ISO 200, and I'm going to adjust this knob. There's a little dot on the side of it, opened and closed. The open and close re relate to this flap. So the flap's open right now, so I'm, ch I'm changing that setting. This is telling me that with, with ISO 200 film, then this, this uh, red line's pointing to the number 12. So on the top of this dial back here on the front, I'm going to find the number 12, and I'm going to align, there's a little tiny, and you're not going to be able to see this, for which I apologize, there's a little tiny yellow triangle next to the aperture setting. So I'm going to put, point that triangle at the number 12, and now any aperture and shutter speed combination that I set will be appropriate for the light level present. So if I change the shutter to 1 it says f11. If I change the shutter now to 1 so 1 60th, it's at f5.6. And it allows the same amount of light onto the film. So that's, that's how this works. Never, never in my life would have figured that out by myself. It, it is, it's really, it's a, a great, great system though. I have a ton of respect for the, for the way that they put it together. I think it's a, a good way of thinking as well. On the bottom we have the tripod bushing here and then the film back lock. So to unlock it we slide this counterclockwise which pushes this lock out, this locking hinge out a little bit so it can be folded back. And I hope there's no film in this. Oh good. And then you can get access to the inside of the camera. I read as I was researching this that the 
Ricomatic 225 has the best film ba or best light baffling system inside the film body of any camera ever made. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, that is quite inside of it. It has quite the film baffle uh, setup, and so it has basically the same thing that we're familiar with from other TLRs. There's a film take up spool down here, film loading spool or area right here. So you load your new film. I have a spool of paper with no film in it. So what I'm going to do is pull out that knob, pull the paper down, load it onto the take-up spool. There we go. And then advance the crank until the start uh, lines up with oops uh, oh yeah until the start lines up with these little triangles down here at the bottom so there's two triangles and those indicate where the start arrows point to now close that lock the clasp turn the lock pulls the clasp back in and as you can see like I said, it does nothing to rewind it, but it does let me know that the film's being taken up. So now we go, I've advanced it to number one, and it's set to go. Look through it, find my picture, focus. The focusing arm's right here on the sides. There's one on each side, so you can focus with either your finger or your thumb, or both for finer focusing. Line up your picture, activate the shutter. And then you don't immediately go to the next frame. You wait until you're going to take your next shot to go to the next frame because advancing the film is going to cock the shutter. And once the shutter is cocked, you do not want to change the shutter speed. It's, it's damaging to this type of shutter. But when you've got uh, one of the quirks of this camera, this specific one, is that if it's not focused at infinity, it will not advance. There we go. So I have to. So after I take a picture that's not at infinity focus, I've got to focus it at, at infinity, and this has to be open to activate the shutter on all of these. There's a mechanism, safety mechanism built in. Then I have to push the shutter release again. It doesn't trigger the shutter again, but it does trigger the lock that allows me to go ahead and advance to the next frame. So you can see that time it worked just fine. But if I go all the way out here, it's locked. It, um, it took me a day to figure that out. And man, I was freaking out and lost a whole bunch of pictures in the process of figuring that out. But I was really freaking out that I had dropped 110 bucks on a camera that didn't work. At any rate, um, so that's, that's, that's one of this camera's, this specific camera's uh, quirks. If your camera's having flaws, who knows? Maybe it's uh, maybe it's not just this camera that it's unique to. Uh, at any rate, some notes on this camera: it has no batteries. The light meter operates with an electrical reaction, a chemical reaction. So there's no batteries to replace. There's no batteries to leak or anything. There's a very high-end model with uh, that competed in quality with the Raleigh flexes of its time but was substantially cheaper because it was uh, Japanese made and in the 50s the Japanese made products were much less expensive than the German and American made ones. So, uh, so we've seen the... Uh, so some other things about this the um, viewing lens and the taking lens both have bay one bayonet mount uh, uh, filter mounts so there are different bayonet t sizes for these. These use bay one. So if you have one of these and you want to know what size, what size filters to get to it for it, there's also a macro close-up filter that has parallax correction. You put you put a piece on each side of this, but it's got um, it's got one of each so that you can see through it with the macro close-up what it's going what you're focusing on, but also so you can get an idea of what 
of what the um, scene's going to look like. This camera does not meter through the top lens, so it meters through, through the behind the nameplate. So if you only want to get one filter set in bay one, and then just use it on the taking lens, you are absolutely able to do that. Personally, I don't see a reason to have two bay one yellow filters and orange and red and whatever else when you're only going to be looking through one of them and taking with the other. <coughs> so, like I mentioned, this has 35 millimeter frame uh, film capability. And we'll look, through, we'll look through here again, and you can see you can see the outline of the 35 millimeter area. This is a uh, this is an 80 millimeter uh, or eight centimeter an 80 millimeter lens on the front of this camera, which for a 6x6 camera is normal. It's about equivalent to a 50 millimeter um, lens in in 35 millimeter terms. Your 80 millimeter lens in this, if you put the 35 millimeter film in, has the same image area or same magnification level as an 80 millimeter lens on your 35 millimeter camera. So it's a really good standard lens in 120 and a really, really good portrait lens in 35 millimeter. That said, uh, if you got 120, I, I don't... I mean, I guess the advantage of 35 millimeters, you could put, take 36 images with it without changing the film. Um, I don't know, I'm, such a, I'm a fan of medium format, so uh, I don't see any reason to use 35 millimeter in a medium format camera unless you're going for a specific artistic effect, such as capturing an image that goes to the entire frame width. That said, the, the mask, part of the, the 35 millimeter setup for this camera includes a mask that goes in back that masks off the rest of the frame so that it's only taking an image that is the 35 millimeter standard frame size. And that's, uh, that's it that I have for this camera. So stay tuned for some photos after this, but the last thing I'm going to mention before I go is don't leave your, this camera and your lenses in your car. It's a very, very precise instrument. It's very high-end. Leaving it in your car is a good way to let the heat or the cold ruin a very good camera that's still extremely usable. Don't store your camera in a plastic bag or closed container because it can develop fungus, which is another really good way to ruin a camera. Uh, don't let your camera get wet. They're old. They're not weather sealed. And lastly, just remember that, that your camera is a precision tool and it's very precise and as long as you treat it with respect and care for it, it will continue to work for you for a long time. So if this video was helpful, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know I'm on the right track. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section and I'll get to them as quickly as I can. I'm pretty good about getting back to them fairly quickly. You can subscribe to my channel as well, and then you'll know whenever I have another video coming out about cameras and photography and developing film and all the different things that are on my channel. And uh, also, if you have a suggestion for a video, let me know. If I have the equipment and the know-how, I'm more than happy to film it for you. And the last thing I say before we go to the photos is thank you guys for watching.